okay in today's lecture and couple of next few lectures i'll just cover the uh, some of the recent research results that are published in the area of biomaterials so that you can have a feel at how the material development in the area of biomaterials are driven by certain issues which are related to both physical properties as well as biological properties. So, this is the physical properties as well as the biological properties. So, certain properties as far as the physical properties like strength, toughness is concerned or biological properties like in vitro cytotoxicity or cell growth, cell proliferation, cell fate processes as well as the in vivo biocompatibility property, those will drive the development of hydroxapatite based bioceramic composites. Now, the fundamental understanding or the basics of the physical properties or biological properties of tissues as well as synthetic materials that were already discussed in the last several lectures. So, these are the kind of equipments like which are these are the facilities which are used in this biomaterials research. So, this is called the SPS that is called spark plasma sintering machine. Essentially, this spark plasma sintering machine involves putting a powder compact here in this graphite dye punch assembly and then you are flowing a high current both through this graphite dye wall as well as through this powder compact. Now, this is the anode, this is the cathode and in high current when it will pass through this powder compact that will help in the densification or consolidation of the materials. It shows that you know three particles which are in contact with each other and then how this current will pass through the particle powder surface and this is the spots where this heating will take place because that will the spots contact spots that will offer resistance to the current flow and as a result juice heating will take place and that will lead to the large temperature increase. So, here the temperature will increase to a high value and that will help in the enhanced mass transport. Now, this is the bacteria culture facility. So, this is this uh, vertical laminar flow where you can do culture of the different bacterial stains like E. coli bacteria or staphylococcus species and so on. So, this is the uh, cell culture uh, uh, facility which are also used and this cell culture facility has several equipments which includes the microscopes like phase contrast microscopes or fluorescent microscope as well as this laminar flow wood where people do this, people use it as a wet bench. We have this CO2 laminar, CO2 incubator for incubating the cells. This is the ACM image typically showing that how the cells proliferate and silver doped hydroxyapatite. Now, what was the central theme of this biomaterials research? Central theme is to develop the bone analog or heart tissue replacement material. Bone analog means it is like a the materials which will have set of properties which will be just sufficient to mimic the bone properties or heart tissue replacement, heart tissue in other words a bone. So, that heart tissue replacement is that like for any orthopedic applications if you want to replace the heart tissues then the materials which can be used those materials uh, need to have optimal combination of physical property that is hardness, strength and toughness and biocompatibility. Now, there are certain terminology aspect in the material science, the hardness, strength or toughness is called the mechanical properties. But in biological literature many times in the ma many standard textbooks, these material properties like hardness, strength and toughness, they are mentioned as physical property. So, physical property in material science, they are mostly mean the density, thermal conductivity, resistivity, all those are physical property. So, this is just a nomenclature or designation the way people tend to describe certain properties in the two different community one is the material science community one is the biological community. Now, through the you know next 50 or 60 lecture slides I will just go through some of the results which are obtained in the hydroxapatite based systems which are in reinforced with mullite or silver or zinc oxide. So, this addition of this different uh, second phase or either ceramic phase or metallic phase, they serve some purpose. Then third one is a macro based glass ceramics. These glass ceramics, 
are used for these dental restorative applications. Then I'll show you that how these different properties that you can obtain in these glass ceramic materials. The fourth one is that polymer ceramic biocomposites that is for trabecular bone generation and also we have developed another set of polymer ceramic composites for heart tissue replacement applications. Now the biocompatibility it has been dealt earlier also but at every lecture certain important concept or certain important definition I feel like reminding you so that you are absorbed with this important concept or important ideas. So to go back to the very fundamental definition of biocompatibility which is proposed by David Williams who is the editor in chief of biomaterials journal. Biocompatibility refers to the ability of biomaterial to perform its desired function with respect to a medical therapy. I again repeat biocompatibility is such an important concept it clearly depends on the application point in mind. So application means if it is a bone replacement or orthopedic applications then you require a set of biocompatibility property. If it is for blood contacting devices like heart valves you require a set of biocompatibility properties which is different from what you need for the bone replacement application. Now without eliciting any undesirable local or systemic effects, if you remember what I meant by systemic effects, now systemic effects can be acute, can be subacute, can be chronic or can be subchronic, depending on how this host response that is observed or realized within certain time frame, right. Now those details I have already you know discussed in details in the recipient or beneficiary of the therapy. Who is the recipient or beneficiary? That is the human being. But generating the most appropriate beneficial cellular or tissue response. Most appropriate beneficial cellular or tissue response means like you know that how these cells will behave when they are in coming in contact with the biomaterials that is what is meant by most appropriate beneficial cellular tissue response whether that fibrous capsule will form in vivo when this material is implanted on specific sites. In that specific situation and optimizing the clinically relevant performance of the therapy. Now whatever was the application point of view in mind your biomaterial should be able to uh, perform in a clinically relevant manner. So it is like a more basic definition of the concept biocompatibility. Now, as I said that you know that development of that new generation biomaterials, it is driven by certain factors. Now, what are those factors? First one is that if you look at this cortical bone, that green row, what you notice is that depending on anatomical location, you have the range of properties which includes tensile strength 60 to 160 megapascal, compressive strength 130 to 180 megapascal, fracture toughness 2 to 12 mp square root meter and elastic modulus 3 to 80 gigapascal. Now if you compare the cortical bone property with that of the hydroxyapatite, what you notice here, then in case of hydroxyapatite you have this tensile strength, compressive strength as well as elastic modulus which are just matching with them or which are even higher than that of the cortical bone properties. However, if you look at this cortical bone fracture toughness and the fracture toughness of hydroxyapatite, then fracture toughness of the hydroxyapatite even does not touch the lower bound toughness of the cortical bone. So that was the point to be noted here and why I am putting so much emphasis on the hydroxyapatite because hydroxyapatite is the inorganic major inorganic component of the natural bone. So therefore, if the hydroxyapatite has good biological properties, but you have to also know that hydroxyapatite lacks certain physical properties and that is the reason why hydroxyapatite cannot be used as a bulk implant materials for several bone replacement applications. Now if you go to the other metallic materials for example titanium or stainless steel or titanium alloys, again if you see their elastic modulus is higher than around 110 or 120 gigapascal which is higher than that cortical bone. So if the difference is too high as I have mentioned in earlier lecture then it can cause the aseptic loosening because this materials itself will bear most of the load. If you look at the stainless steel, now stainless steel has an elastic modulus of 200 gigapascal. That shows that stainless steel elastic modulus is more than double that of the cortical bone even the highest range, highest bound modulus. 
So, that is the reason that you know stainless steel in many cases except the stem of the total heap replacement cannot be used as a bone replacement materials. Now, therefore, if I summarize that what are the advantages and disadvantages of hydroxyapatite, hydroxyapatite is a typical, it has a chemical formula of CA10, PO4, whole 6, OH, whole 2 and that is the main mineral composition of human bone and teeth. So, if you have this teeth, teeth also has a large amount of the hydroxyapatite and because it is the major mineral composition of the human bone and teeth, that is the reason it can easily bond biologically with living bones and tissues and hence hydroxyapatite shows bioactivity. Now, what are the disadvantages of hydroxyapatite? The first one is that it has poor mechanical properties that is the hardness, strength and toughness variation and definitely it is unsuitable for load bearing applications. The second one it is more critical because when you put the material as an implant inside the in vivo condition other factor that needs to be considered as the prosthetic infection. Prosthetic infection means like if you put this implant at the specific site lot of bacteria they will be attracted and if they are attracted and if they stay happily on the implant surface then that cause prosthetic infection. Now, in order to avoid the infection you have to develop some materials which has good antimicrobial property. Unfortunately, hydroxyapatite does not have antimicrobial property. Okay? Now, that has been shown in the next slide. Now, if you see this particular slide or uh, this ACM image is actually uh, taken after the 4 hours of incubation of E. coli bacteria on the hydroxyapatite surface. Now, this E. coli bacteria is the gram negative bacteria which has a typical aspect ratio of 5 to 10 that is aspect ratio means length to diameter ratio and this is a typical rod like bacteria and they are actually happily uh, surviving on this uh, material surface. So, that shows that hydroxyapatite does not have a very good antimicrobial property. Other things that important thing is the hydroxyapatite that it has very uh, highly it is highly brittle. Now, this is your Vickers indent. Now, if you look at this indent and if you look at the region surrounding this indent, then what you notice here that region just adjacent to the Vickers indent, this is the region where spalling takes place, spalling or chipping of materials that take place and because these cracks are extensive that this extensive crack formation leads to spalling. However, this crack length which is called radial crack length which actually from all the corners of the Vickers indent, those cracks are also relatively larger in length at the 50 Newton load, which is indicates that their fracture toughness is essentially very low and if you determine this fracture toughness, this fracture toughness is less than 1 MPa square root meter. So, the two aspects which are important which drive the development of hydroxyapatite based composites, the first one is a poor fracture toughness of hydroxyapatite, the second one is that lack of bactericidal property, bactericidal means there is a lack of ability to kill the bacteria in contact with that particular material. Now, the question is that what are the solutions? There are two solutions. One is the coating approach. Coating is like you know you can coat this hydroxyapatite on the titanium or titanium alloys or stainless steel substrate whichever it is true. So, you can coat the stainless steel substrate or uh, titanium or titanium alloys. So, thereby you are trying to combine the good bioactive property of the hydroxyapatite with good strength property of the titanium alloy. So, you are essentially combined good mechanical or physical property of the metallic alloys with the good bioactive properties of the ceramic coatings that is hydroxyapatite. But there are major concerns, major problems is that coating thickness as well as the adhesion of the coating. Now, coating thickness typically means if the coating is not very thick then the coating does not have a longer lifetime and uh, if the coating is very thick then the coating can be ruptured or the coating can be delaminated from the substrate. So, both the aspects actually create limited lifetime uh, to this hydroxyapatite coatings. Now, the composite approach, composite approach is that hydroxyapatite composite with optimal com amount of a you know, biocompatible phase can be developed to achieve better physical properties without compromising on the biocompatibility and the bacteriocidal property. Now, what this statement means? This statement means that you can add 
the second phase x or y in a particular amount provided that x and y are not toxic or non biocompatible in nature and with the ultimate aim to achieve better physical properties. Better physical means better toughness properties or strength properties. However, that increase in the physical properties should not take place at the expense of biocompatibility or the bactericidal property. Okay? So, this is the major thing that is important for this composite or bulk approach. Now, some more information on this hydroxyapatite based composites. Now, in various hydroxyapatite composites, particularly with ceramic reinforcements, now if you see the ceramic reinforcement like alumina, zirconia, glass or glass ceramic or hydroxyapatite whiskers, fracture toughness is reported to be enhanced up to 1.5 to 2 MPa square meter. Because as you have noticed that in the last to last slide, I have mentioned that hydroxyapatite fracture toughness is around less than uh, 1 MPa square meter. So, what this statement means? This statement means if you add alumina or zirconia or hydroxyapatite whiskers, the fracture toughness can be modestly improved, and this modest improvement is shown in the final toughness values of up to 2 MPa square meter. Now, what are the critical issues that should be considered in the development of hydroxyapatite? The first one is the phase stability in terms of the dissociation of hydroxyapatite. Now, hydroxyapatite, as you know, that it has a formula that C A 10, P O 4 whole 6 and O H whole 2. Now, this can be transformed to C A 3, P O 4 whole 2. Now, C A 3, P O 4 whole 2 is the called tricalcium phosphate. Now, this tricalcium phosphate is popularly known as T C P. Now, this has two polymorphs, one is alpha T C P and one is the beta T C P. Now, this transformation of hydroxyapatite to alpha TCP or beta TCP that take place more easily or more favorably in some of the composites where you add this alumina or zirconia as a reinforcement. Other problem is that with this hydroxyapatite, suppose you add zirconia to hydroxyapatite during sintering, if you do not control the sintering conditions fairly well, then what happens? This zirconia can react with now. First of all, this hydroxyapatite can release this TCP or can be dissociated in TCP and if you uh, balance these reactions, then you will end up having one CAO, one mole of CAO from one mole of uh, hydroxyapatite. And this CAO can further react with zirconium oxide and this can form calcium zirconate. Okay? So, what I am saying here that these sintering reactions also can take place depending on what kind of reinforcement you add to this hydroxyapatite. Okay? And if your sintering reactions take place, then you cannot take full advantage or 100 percent advantage out of the fact that you have the hydroxyapatite in the material. Third one is that it has a lack of crack growth resistance or damage tolerance property and this damage tolerance property is mostly the toughness or strength property. The fourth one is the retention of good biocompatibility or bioactivity property. Now, this good biocompatibility or bioactivity property is lost when your hydroxyapatite is transformed to tricalcium phosphate or it undergoes sintering reactions. Fifth point is that significant adherence of bacteria on the hydroxyapatite surface and that essentially leads to prosthetic infection or infection at the implant site. Now, Typically in the laboratory scale uh, synthesis route, hydroxyapatite can be synthesized by what is known as suspension precipitation route. Now, what is suspension precipitation route? You can start with the calcium oxide as a precursor. Another precursor can be orthophosphoric acid. Now, this calcium oxide and orthophosphoric acid, you can allow them to react and that reaction produces hydroxyapatite. Now, some of the experiments that was carried out uh, to improve the hydroxyapatite toughness that was to add mullite to hydroxyapatite surface. Now, this is the as synthesized hydroxyapatite surface. Now, if you look at this part, this is 2 micron here. So, therefore, individual particles here which is more largely spherical in nature, these individual particles is certainly in the range of nano size of 100 nanometer or little bit higher or lower than 100 nanometer. The other important thing is that whether you have the phase pure hydroxyapatite 
or single phase hydroxyapatite that can only be confirmed by the CA by P ratio. And this CA by P ratio you can measure by ICP that is the inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. And from that you can find out the CA by P ratio if it is 1.67, then, then only you can say that this hydroxyapatite is a phase pure hydroxyapatite. Now, if you do this normal sintering, pressureless sintering of hydroxyapatite with the mullite, for example, just to improve the fracture toughness, I will show you why mullite increases the fracture toughness, how mullite content increases the fracture toughness. Now, the, these sintering experiments were carried out for 2 hours in simple air at different temperature right from 1000 to 1400 degrees Celsius. It was not known that at what temperature you can obtain sufficiently high density in the hydroxyapatite mullite and that was the reason that why sintering temperature were needed to be optimized. Now, if you look at this uh, around 1300 to 1350 degree Celsius, you get close to 90 to 95 percent theoretical density. Now, this is the XRD spectra and this XRD spectra essentially tells you that when you have a starting powder, you have this characteristic hydroxyapatite peak and you have also the mullite peak. Now, when you add this 38 percent mullite or 10 percent mullite to this material and sinter them at 1350 for 2 hours, what you see here multiple peaks like you have this TCP that is alpha TCP peak, you have the hydroxyapatite peak, you have this star one that is a beta TCP peak, you have the galenite peak, etcetera, etcetera. Now, what is this galenite? Galenite is C2A, C2A means 2 calcium oxide alumina and silica that is a ternary compound. Now, you are starting with your only hydroxyapatite and mullite. Now, when you are seeing that all these multiple phases are formed, what it means? It means hydroxyapatite must have dissociated to form this alpha and beta TCP that is number one and subsequently there are some other sintering reactions must have taken place to explain the formation of this uh, galenite and other phase. Now, what we have proposed is that if you start with this CA10 PO4 whole 6 OH whole 2 that is hydroxyapatite, it forms this tralcassium phosphate TCP, it releases CAO. Now, this CAO can react with this 3 alumina 2 silica which is nothing but mullite. So, mullite is the solid solution of alumina 2 silica and that is 3 to 2 ratio. Now, if you look at these reactions, then CAO reacts with this mullite and then it will form uh, calcium aluminosilicate and this calcium aluminosilicate the formation is also associated with one mole of alumina. So, all these sintering reactions essentially explain that why these multiple phases are formed during this sintering. Now, typical ACM image essentially tells you that you have a microporosity in the structure and this porosity is roughly 5 to 10 micron in size. Okay? And this microporosity is also associated with certain grain boundary phase and most likely it is this calcium aluminosilicate phase which is formed along this grain. So, this is your tricalcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite CAP grains. Now, more analysis was carried out using the transmission electron microscopy. Now, what you see here that mullite is the needle like structure okay? and these mullite particles are dispersed in the microstructure and there is sintered reaction product and this sintered reaction product is nothing but C2As that is the 2 calcium oxide alumina and silica that is calcium alumina silicate. And what you see here further this, cal this C2As is formed at the interface of hydroxyapatite, mullite and you have the another tricalcium phosphate. Now, if you know the microscopy well then if you take the selected area diffraction pattern from individual hydroxyapatite or mullite or the sintered reaction product, then you can confirm the presence of all these phases. You can index it just like you can index the XRD phases. Similarly, you can index from the selected area diffraction pattern and that is what has been done here. You can see this is the zone axis and this is the hydroxyapatite. From mullite, this is the zone axis and from alpha tricalcium phosphate, this is the zone axis. Now, these spots essentially tells you this kind of spotty pattern essentially tells you all these phases are crystalline in nature. If there is a ring pattern in the transmission microscopy, 
then that will essentially indicate that is amorphous in nature, lack of crystalline. Now, this set of, this is the dark field image and this is the bright field image. So, this set of bright field and dark field image essentially tells you that this, there is a partial weighting of this C2AS phase. The, this is the C2AS phase that is formed due to the reaction. This is your mullite particle, this is your half particle. Now, essentially what, you t what, what it shows you that this is the uh, a part, a partial weighting of this grain boundary by the C2AS phase and this C2AS phase if you take a selected error diffraction pattern then this is 0, 0, 001 zone axis and along that you can find that there are spot patterns and then this is the spot patterns then again this C2AS phase is crystalline in nature not an amorphous phase. Okay? Other things that you can notice this is a EDAC spectra that you can get in the TEM from the C2AS phase if you take it shows the calcium peak strong peak because it is 2 CaO so that means the calcium peak should be strong you have also reasonably aluminum peak because it's Al2O3 is also there and also you have SiO2 so that silicon peak also comes from that so essentially the combination of SADP pattern that is selected area diffraction pattern coupled with this EDS analysis confirms the presence of C2A space as a grain boundary region in this microstructure. Now, this is more bright field image essentially tells you that there is a galenite phase here which is a C2A space. You have these needles, these needles are essentially mullite needles okay? and these needles are mullite needles which has a very high large aspect ratio of 8 to 10 and if you look at this this is 200 nanometer so essentially this width of this mullite needle is 200 nanometer and also you have the CAO phase and how to confirm the CAO phase if you look at the CDAX pattern it only shows you calcium and oxygen so that means there is no doubt undoubtedly it is CAO phase other things also it is confirmed that this it takes that in SRDP that is selected area diffraction pattern and at 001 zone axis you can see again these spots reflection planes it essentially tells you that this is actually the coming from CAO. Now I have shown you enough of microscopy now let us discuss that mechanical properties or physical properties of this uh, materials. Now as I shown you at the beginning of this lecture that hydroxapate is essentially brittle phase this has been proven again this has been proved again now if you take the 5 kg load Vickers indent then you can see there is a lot of this falling or indent induced damage in this material. But when you make these composites, even at the 10 kg load, you can see there is a sharp Vickers indent. That means it is essentially damage resistant. If you look at that, so what I am trying to say here, if you take the 10 kg load in the hydroxapatite, it will be even much more severe damage of the indent induced damage. But even at the 10 kg level in the composite, you can see the perfectly sharp and very well distinct Vickers image essentially tells you that this material must have better damage resistance property clear. The second thing that you notice that there is also some cracks which are forming which is not that clear but I can see on the image very closely that you know that there are certain cracks which are propagating from this Vickers uh, indent corner and based on this crack length essentially you can measure the fracture toughness I will show you later. Now elastic modulus, elastic modulus can be measured from two ways. One is the load penetration and one is the impulse excitation. Load penetration means like you take a micro indent, this is the loading curve and your unloading curve will be like this. Now from the slope of this initial phase of this unloading curve, from this slope it will give you the elastic modulus. Now this is the load and this is your penetration depth that is H. So from that you can find out that what is the elastic modulus of this materials. Another way you can measure this elastic modulus is impulse excitation like you take a bar samples you can impulse it with some heating with the, some steel balls or something or tungsten carbide balls and then you can measure the resonance frequency you apply certain general formula you can get the elastic modulus of these materials. Now, independent of what measurement technique you use, the message from this slide is that, that you can get this range of this 
elastic modulus which is roughly around 45 to 85 and this 45 to 85 gigapascal elastic modulus which will closely correlate with that elastic modulus values of the cortical bone that is the natural bone. So, therefore, this hydroxypatite mullite materials that depending on the sintering temperature that you can find out that you know what is the elastic modulus values which you require for real applications. Let us look at the strength properties. Now, the strength properties for ceramic materials you can measure only the compressive strength. Compressive means you can take a sample, you can put a pressure from both the ends, then you can measure the what is the load at which sample is broken. From that you can calculate what is the compressive strength. And we have also measured the three point flexural strength. Three point flexural strength means you can take a bar separate sample, you can put it, you, you can you can place this bar separate sample on two support rows. From the top roll which is placed at the half of the span length here, you pressurize it, you break the bar, you measure that what is the load at which the bar is broken and based on this geometry of the sample and the load at which the load at the fracture point, then you can calculate that what is the flexural strength of this material. Now, what you can notice here that with increasing mullite content like half 10 m, half 20 m and half 30 m that means essentially means 10 weight percent mullite, 20 weight percent mullite and 30 weight percent mullite, your compressive strength is subsequently increases and this increased value of compressive strength can go as close as 400 mega Pascal. Now, 400 mega Pascal compressive strength in ceramics is quite a respectable number. Now, if you look at the flexural strength, because hydroxybate itself is very poor in flexural strength, you can get a maximum of 80 mega Pascal. So, you are getting close to 400 mega Pascal compressive strength and you get close to 80 mega Pascal flexural strength in this material and this combination of strength properties are quite good as far as the application of these materials is concerned. Now, fracture toughness, fracture toughness essentially means what is the resistance to the crack growth in these materials. Okay? So, the property which describes the resistance to crack growth that is what fracture toughness means. Now, we have measured this single edge V-notch beam technique. Now, single edge V-notch beam technique means you make this V-notch here at this root of this one and then you can put this V-notch beam samples in the tensile side and then you put it under these two support roll here and from these two top roll you can apply this P by 2, P by 2 load. Okay? Then you can find out that at what load from the equilibrium of this point, these two support rolls also must support the P by 2 load at each point. Now, this is called four point flexural configuration. Now, based on this different uh, crack length as well as the fracture load and so on, you can actually calculate that what is the mode 1 fracture toughness. K1C stands for critical trace intensity factor under mode 1 loading, K1C, often the students pronounce it KIC which is wrong, K1C stands for critical stress intensity factor under mode 1 loading. Now, the other way you can measure the fracture toughness for brittle materials like ceramics is that by crack length measurement and this crack length measurement it has been shown for example, if this is a 2C that is the total crack length. In both longitude and transverse direction, you can measure this 2C crack length and then based on this diagonal 2A, then you can adopt different formula like formula proposed by Kochi Nihara tells you that K1 C is nothing but 0 0.018 multiplied by H, H is the hardness, A is the half diagonal Vickers diagonal, E is the elastic modulus, H is the hardness, C is the half of the crack length. Now, if we apply this formula, you can get a value of the fracture toughness of these materials. Now, we have measured these two properties fracture toughness using the both the values like you know both the uh, indentation toughness as well as the ACVNB value. What you get here in the ACVNB value the fracture toughness value is does not overestimate, but in the indentation toughness fracture toughness values overestimate. And what you get here fracture toughness is 1.5 mp square root meter that is the ACVNB value single edge V notch beam value and that is the value you can get it both 20 percent mullite and 30 percent mullite. In pure half 
your fractal toughness value close to 0.6 MPa square root meter. So, this is 0 0.6 and this is 1.5. Now, if you look at this value, if you compare the what is the toughness of the base material that is hydroxyapatite, you can immediately realize that there has been modest improvement in the fractal toughness values. The other thing that I must mention here that if you go to the ACVNB value, this value is most reliable. And many times in the community, ceramics community, people have questioned the measurement of this fracture toughness using the indentation technique. So, this is a question mark. So, therefore, whatever value you are getting from indentation, that is also question mark. However, this value that what you get in the single edge B-notch beam technique, that is the most reliable because in the, it does not overestimate the toughness properties of this material. Let us see some table which essentially tells you that what is the typical toughness values of the different materials which are developed why they are different research groups. Now, if you take the hydroxyapatite based materials it is a 0 0.6 in the 20 volume percent white ZP half composite it is 1.5, 20 volume percent alumina half composite it is 1.25, in the glass ceramic it is 2 MP square root meter. Now, unfortunately, all these materials, all these toughness values are obtained by the indentation toughness only or indentation cracking only. So, essentially, again, I can put a question mark here because if you measure the ACVNB toughness values of these materials, I can very well tell you that these values will further decrease. So, whatever you are getting 1.5, it will not be 1.5, but it may be below 1 even MPS per root meter. So, what I am trying to say essentially that the toughness values that which are being measured with the hydroxyapatite mullite values certainly tells you that you can get a good ACVNB toughness properties from these materials which are not being even achieved with any other materials which are reported till date. Now, in vitro properties, this is a kind of standard protocol for this in vitro properties. First, you have to do the steam autoclave and either you can do autoclave by steam autoclave or you can do autoclaving by gamma radiation. Now, for the ceramics like <coughs> hydroxyapatite based so on that steam autoclave is ok. Then you have to seed the cells on this material. So, you can take the 96 well plate or you can take that 6 well plate and so on. So, this is the micro well plate and then you can put these materials inside the CO2 incubator where there is atmosphere is maintained at 5 percent CO2, 95 percent air and then also you have the good amount of humidity that is maintained inside the CO2 incubator. Now, you can do the cell addition test, then you can do the dehydration or the serial dilution, then you can further use the critical point trial and you can proceed towards the ACM or fluorescence microscopy to see the morphology of the cells. Now, alternatively you can use some biochemical assays. So, these biochemical assays essentially will quantify certain cellular fate processes. What are the cellular fate processes? MTT that will give you the cellular viability, then ALP that alkaline phosphate that will tell you the osteoblast differentiation capability and osteocalcin tells you the bone mineralization capability. Now, L99 is the mouse fibroblast cells which is the connective tissue cells, cells of the connective tissue of the mouse. So, these are cultured for 24 hours on different hydroxyapatite 20 percent mullite, 30 percent mullite and this is your control sample. Now, if you compare this cell uh, adhesion as well as cell proliferation with this one as well as with this one, you did not see much difference in terms of the cell adhesion and proliferation. Interesting features that you can clearly see here that is cell to cell cellular network. Okay? And this cellular network you can see very clearly here and this is somewhere it is called cellular bridges, cell bridges. And overall all the hydroxyapatite uh, uh, mullite surfaces are completely covered by this L929 cells and this shows good biocompatibility in vitro cytocompatibility property of these materials. Now, MTT assay was performed trying to quantify that cell viability of these materials and as far as the cell viability is concerned, you can see that this is for the pure hydroxyapatite, this is for the hydroxyapatite 20 mullite, this is for the 30 mullite. Now, you see here this error bars overlap and from this to this again, it is roughly the error bars overlap and this and this error bars overlap. So, what I am trying to say here 
that for this as far as the MTT assay is concerned, this hydroxyapatite mullite they have similar MTT values like the pure hydroxyapatite. And what it means? That means when you add 10 to 30 percent of the mullite to hydroxyapatite, you do not compromise anything as far as the cell viability is concerned. That means you are not reducing the cellular viability by adding this mullite to hydroxyapatite samples. Now, as far as the ALP expression is concerned, that alkaline phosphatase activity and these tests were done for 3 days as well as 7 days and this is the statistical analysis of part found for p less than 0 0.05 and what you see here that for the 3 days this pure hydroxyapatite and 10 to 20 30 molar does not show any statistical significant difference except this one but here in the 7 days the difference is quite significant if you see compared to this hydroxyapatite to all these materials in 10 20 30 that significant difference is obtained. That means that these materials they show better osteogenic differentiation property in this when L2 L929 cells were cultured on this material. So these are like Mg63 that is osteoblast like cells were cultured on this material. Now osteocalcin which is a bone mineralization. So essentially this bone mineralization So, bone mylation property are ev evaluated. Then again, for this pure hydroxyapatite and how to say 10 percent mullite, this 20 and 30 they really stand out. That means, this 20 and 30 percent mullite materials they have better ability for the bone mineralization and therefore they have better osteocalcin expression when Mg62 that is osteoblast like cells were cultured on this material surfaces. Now, what was the reason for this difference in this in vitro? cytocompatibility or in vitro, I mean in vitro that biomineralization property, etc. Now, first of all, you have to look at this AFM images of these materials. Now, atomic force microscopy images tells you that in the grain boundary region, you have a microscale roughness. That means, this grain boundary phases which are formed, that is C2AS phase, that is 2, two calcium oxide, 1 alumina, 1 silica. The C2AS phase essentially forms and that increases the microscale roughness of this material. The second thing is that these materials actually they are like BCP phase. BCP means that is like biphasic calcium phosphate microstructure and they contain beta TCP as well as the hydroxyapatite phase. And then other things that BCP that is bicalcium, biphasic calcium phosphate phase has better osteogenicity than single phase hydroxyapatite. So, that is also important because if the BCP phase is preferred than hydroxyapatite, then as per the biological compatibility property is concerned, people always desire this BCP phase in the microstructure. Third one is this, as you remember the TM image, the transmission electron microscopy image that these materials they have a calcium oxide and the additional presence of calcium oxide also influences the biocompatibility property. Now, pressureless sintering of this hydroxyapatite, they always leads to multiple meta multiple phases and these phases actually also influence the mechanical properties to some extent. Now, next set of experiments that I will show the results of this experiments that I will show that to demonstrate that how these sintering reactions can be avoided in this hydroxyapatite based system. Now, for that we have carried out part plasma sintering experiments. And this part plasma sintering, as I explained to you earlier, so it is like a hot press, but the fundamental difference is that large amount of current is flowing, made to flow from the anode to cathode during this part plasma sintering. And this current is around 1 to 1.5 kilo ampere, which is larger than that of the welding current that typically used in industry. Now, this current will flow either to the graphite die wall or to the powder compact, depending on the conductivity of the powder compact, porous powder compact and this current will influence this high temperature generates around this neck region or the triple pocket region and also because this contact contact resistance at the particle particle contact that offer some kind of resistance to the current flow that also increases the total heat generation at this neck region and higher the temperature more is the diffusion coefficient and therefore more will be the diffusion and mass transport process which is required for this sintering to take place. Now, we have done experiments till from 1000 to 1050 to 1200 degrees Celsius and what you see 
at around 1100 degrees Celsius, these materials we can get roughly around 100% theoretical density. Now, this is that hydroxyapatite as synthesized, and then when you center this SPS, this at 1000 or 1150 degrees Celsius, what you see, we do not see any presence of the hydroxyapatite tricalcium phosphate except at the 1150 degrees Celsius samples, and there is no other reaction product like calcium aluminosilicate or alumina or silica, those kind of reaction product is not there. So, it is very clear that if you use a spark plasma sintering, you can avoid those sintering reactions and you can retain both hydroxyapatite and mullite phase in the microstructure. So, I think I will stop here and then in the next lecture, I will start with this hydroxyapatite based biocomposites, how to design this hydroxyapatite based biocomposite with significant bacteriocidal properties.